commercialization of smart service technology. So I think it's only appropriate to be, uh, can share this uh, wisdom and experience with us today. Thanks very much. Thank you very much, Rob. And also thank you very much for an excellent meeting. I've enjoyed it thoroughly. Today I'm here to evangelize what should be part of any smart services meeting, and that is tethered membranes. And you're very good to be here at the last session of the day. And I thought to get your attention, what I would do is to introduce you to the event that really turned me on to looking at membranes as one of the things that I think uh, we should really be, in which we should be most interested. This goes back into the late 60s, where in the night, in the night sky in Murchison, a small town about 100 kilometers north of Melbourne, they had a wonderful fireworks display, and it was indeed a meteoritic shower. And one of my friends from University of Santa Cruz, David Dima, uh, came out and reported that the field in which he was collecting these meteoritic particles smelt very, very strongly of sulfur, and there was this wonderful sense of the primordial about the whole event. He took these samples back to his lab, he polished them, and saw processes in the surface that you really would have had a hard time saying weren't actual cell structures. The coup de grace, however, was that they then extracted, using a lipid extraction solvent techniques, and rehydrated that extraction, and they formed liposomes. And this was undeniably outside our solar system, you are dealing here with an extraterrestrial source of organics, which, if dispersed in water, form membranes. Therefore, wherever there is life, there will indeed be a membrane. So it means whether or not you are dealing with some property of sensing, sounds, uh, taste, sound, sight, touch, smell, whether you're dealing with signaling, you think a thought and contract a muscle, whether you're dealing with uh, virtually any area of biophysical or medical research, biomeridian um, remediation, a membrane will be in there somewhere. And this is one of the things that motivate us to try and find simpler, better techniques to being able to easily study membranes. Traditionally, membranes have been studied by beautiful techniques, electrophysiological techniques, which are indeed a calling in their own right. And one of the small things that we're hoping to bring uh, to the scientific community is the idea that you can achieve a lot, not all, but you can achieve a lot of what the electrophysiology lab can achieve using a far simpler, cheaper, quicker technique involving tethered membranes. The key elements within the tethered membrane structure is the fact that you have a gold surface down here in which you are bringing a non polar region, which is typical of what you'd expect as the hydrophobic ionic barrier portion of a membrane, most importantly, though, in the architectures that, that we've evolved over the years, we have a polar region which is sandwiched in between the membrane and the gold, which has water within it. And this is the moral equivalent of the inside of a cell. We have mobile species in the external surface. You want to have a fluid membrane, and you have a mixture of mobile and tethered species in the inner leaflet of the membrane. The way in which they're, they're constructed, as I'm sure many of you will have um, had experience with building self-assembled membranes or self-assembled model airs. We start out typically with uh, submillimolar concentrations of these kind of compounds in ethanol. You must agonize a lot over the purity of your gold. We heard this morning in the uh, delightful uh, uh, talk in impedance spectroscopy how it is very important to have a flat surface. And over the years, we have indeed, in, in uh, following the path that Rob described, described at the opening, have gone out many, many a blind alley and have come up now with a technique for being able to make delightfully smooth, partly pure, gold-coated surfaces. The kind of molecules we've now honed in on are molecules in which we use a disulfide to avoid the problems of uh, instability in thiol solutions, which of course oxidize if you try and store them. We have benzyl uh, uh, groups as uh, spacer molecules that separate out uh, the tethered uh, initial model layer. And most importantly, we have a mixture of groups which have just the hydrophilic species and groups which have the hydrophilics plus the hydrophobic species. And by means of changing the ratio of those two species that you have in your initial model layer, you can now change the degree of fluidity within your initial model layer. In addition to that, of course, you've now got to add in the fluid mobile second layer of the bilayer. And uh, one does that also in alcohol. 
and the kind of molecules that we employ here are, again, a mixture. And uh, as we heard this morning from a couple of speakers that the work was done in Canberra in the uh, 70s and 80s, looking at the actual geometric shape of a molecule will indeed determine whether it's a micelle or a bilayer or whatever phase. And likewise, if you're trying to crack pack with proteins, you need to juggle the ratio of molecules with large heads and molecules with small heads. So adjusting the ratios of these two species allows you now to adjust the packing geometry in the fluid components of your membrane. And when you add water, miraculously, the whole thing will just spontaneously form itself into a tethered soap bubble, and that is the tethered membrane. What we do is we actually make a range of different ratios, and one can go everywhere from a system which is supported but not tethered. And in fact, you can carry out short-term experiments on supported membranes, and uh, you take your chances with whatever it is nature has provided you with, which is typically something of the order of a uh, four to five nanometer gap between the membrane and the underlying reservoir region. As you increase the ratio of tethers from 1% up to say 80%, which is the typical range that we work through, one now has gone from a monolayer, which is more fluid but less stable, up to one which is far more stable but far less fluid. And some of the things that people worry about in dealing with tethered membranes is exactly what degree of fluidity do you have in order to allow your proteins to adopt the right configurations for monomers to aggregate into monomers and the like. You can do a very simple sum based upon molecular weights and densities and calculate if you had a hydrocarbon core of, say, an ion channel or of a membrane-associated protein lodged within the hydrophobic region of the membrane, how big in terms of dimensions and ultimately in terms of the molecular weight of that protein would you need to go before you started to experience uh, constraints as a consequence of some of the tethers getting in the way of your protein. And you can see now on this scale, you can run from large indeterminate molecular weights all the way down to something which is about 2,000 uh, Daltons as a molecular weight of something like, say, abelinomycin or gramocidin. Uh, and there, of course, you can work with a very uh, much more stable structure. So you can go down this range, and uh, this is a very good range to work in, so between 10 and 100 K, and one can achieve nice stable membranes, and yet allow you now to accommodate quite bulky proteins in there, and to carry out experiments which hitherto require far more complex uh, uh, equipment to perform. The sort of um, uh, device that we have for measurement, and uh, you saw one of ours uh, this morning, it's in, in injection molded, I hang my head in shame, in China. Um, and the composition, um, or the actual construction of this, is such that we have the electrodes down here, um, and there's six of them. And you can see down in this little uh, inset here, the actual measurement electrodes are down on the bottom of a flow cell. And you add your sample into the well here, and it flows through. And this actually now achieves the passage of your sample across the surface of the membrane, which is logged down onto the, uh, uh, the base of this cartridge. The return electrode is actually on the reverse of the cartridge, as you can see here. So we deposit gold on the reverse of the cartridge, and this now provides you with a non-toxic, uh, not like a nasty silver surface, a non-toxic surface. It's a gold surface, it's a very large area surface. It's something which acts essentially as a giant capacitive sink. And having agonized with, with a range of different kinds of counter electrodes, we found this is really very, very satisfactory. It provides minimal uh, uh, drift. You can put bias voltage on it. You don't end up with ablation or sacrificial uh, counter electrodes causing drift. Um, and the actual flow path, which you can see now in larger section here, is determined by the thickness of the laminate. And we run laminates everywhere down from about 15 microns up to what we want, 200, 300 microns. And it depends on whether or not you're dealing with this as a, a freestanding device or a device with a, an actual syringe pump in here, which is formally drawing sample over the uh, electrode, as to um, what thickness of uh, laminate that you um, are employing. Why would you want to actually bother about flowing sample? We've all been brought up on ELISA wells, and ELISA wells work fine. You just put your sample in there and make your measurement. If you have ever observed bears in the woods, 
and times are tough, and the bears go down to the river to feed, and there's only very, very few fish out there, you don't find them crowding round a lake to try and catch the few fish, because the few bears that are there first might get the occasional fish, which happens next to the shore. You might be the receptor that gets lucky, and when you put your sample into the ELISA well, the few molecules that collide with the surface of the base of the ELISA well will be down, the rest will be up, equivalent to the fish far away uh, from the edge of the lake. If, however, the clever bears, you do what the clever bears do, and you find a narrow canal in which the lake is passing, you just wait there and the fish is passing by. And this is the reason why it is essential that in any kind of quantitative measure, whether it's the insertion of an iron channel into a membrane, whether it's the insertion of a plug into an iron channel, whether it's the capture of an analyte by a receptor, it is essential that what you do is you have flow. And here, if this denotes the green analyte particles passing over a surface, the bottom here is denoting, uh, or these, these are denoting the bottom surface of this flow cell, where you've got lots of receptors, the liquid is coming in from the left and flowing right, you can see as it flows, there is the natural parabolic front that you always get as liquid flows down the surface due to the drag on the edge, but note this gap. This gap is due to the fact that the bears at the edge have eaten the fish first, so it means that the analyte is in fact being depleted as the sample flows through. If you just left it still, you would have to wait for unstirred natural diffusion for things to become bound, and that would mean you would never be able to measure what the true reaction rate was. You must flow, and there are certain sums you could do to calculate how much you've got to flow against certain on rates and off rates to achieve a sensible answer. How we actually make the measurements, uh, our little meter, there's a six channel bridge that looks like this, and it has a socket into which you actually push that like so. It is powered by a USB plug, and uh, it, it will provide you a, uh, um, an impedance vector, either in swept frequency mode, um, from 0.1 hertz up to kilohertz, um, of impedances uh, 1,000 ohm up to 100 mega ohms, which covers most of the um, of the kind of measurements that uh, we want to make. Um, work with Stella Valenzuela Valen Valen at UTS, also with her colleagues at the University of New South Wales, Macquarie University. We have carried out uh, a number of, uh, of um, studies looking at the chloride intracellular ion channel, and you can see here with the introduction of um, doses of ion channel as we're actually achieving a saturation of this particular ion channel's penetration into the membrane. You can see that the resistance is dropping, meaning that the current is increasing. Um, and you can see here a uh, superposition of uh, a monomer of the uh, click channel incorporated into uh, uh, one of our uh, partially tethered membranes. Sort of things you can do which are really breaking new ground, new directions to look at, is you can actually follow the kinetics of insertion, determine what the actual rate constant for that is, and then by rinsing the system, uh, look at the uh, process of elimination from the membrane. There's a whole host of questions about why does the channel go in, how does it associate once it's in there, uh, what are the conditions under which you can now get the uh, channel bit eliminated, oxidation reduction tech um, uh, processes occurring uh, within the structure of the channel. Sort of thing that people are always interested in is determining, well, I've got a molecule and I know it does seem to cause conduction when I insert it into my membrane. Is it as a result of the molecule intrinsically being like a beta barrel and causing conduction just as a result of being there? Or is it as a result of dimers coming together or trimers? You can indeed identify this fairly straightforwardly simply by doing a concentration dependence. And depending upon the form of increase in conduction as a function of concentration, you can now elucidate whether it's monomers, dimers, trimers, what have you. And that's another general area which is quite uh, uh, interesting to pursue. If, however, you have a large family of uh, compounds that you want to look at, something which only at the end of last year uh, we were very proud to succeed in doing, Analog Devices Electronics Firm has come up with a new chip which allows you actually to make a card like this under which um, there is, uh, un under which each one of those little dots, there's a separate amplifier, which allows you to convert the six-channel reading, which you have here, into a 96-channel reading. Again, it powers 
from a USB port, so you just plug that into your computer, and 96 